All right, in the continuation of Hebrews 3, let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you and we thank you for this time we have. There's no one like you, all the earth. We just celebrate who you are. We desire to know you. We consider your word right now, your truth before us. Holy Spirit, rise up. Open our minds, open our hearts to receive the fullness of what you want to say to us. Lord, that we would be responsive and respond to what you say. So many just hear the word, but do not obey it. Help us to hear and obey that we might transform this world by the power of your Spirit moving through us, in us, and through us, in us, and through us. In Jesus' name, Amen. So before I, I get into Hebrews uh, chapter 3, we, I want to just encourage you, I've been praying, and um, I, I first of all thank you for for you who are critiquing these sermons, I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I, th I think, I believe, and no one really said this, but I believe it blesses you as well as you really ponder what, what you got out of the sermon. It's almost like I used to do this where um, after a sermon I'd give, I would have a, a moment, like five minutes, where uh, I'd allow the congregation to ponder and to really digest what specifically God was saying to them <clears throat> so that they would actually put into action that which they heard. They wouldn't just be like, oh, that was a good sermon. That, you know, that made a lot of sense and made me feel good or that convicted me. Um, and then on with their lives, on with their lives. Uh, but it really is, um, you know, what I say, what people say as they preach or teach even even our call as Christians, whatever we say, it should be the very words of God. And so it's supposed to do something in your heart. It's supposed to build you up and encourage you, spur you on to more good works. It's supposed to enlighten you to more of who God is. The words are not supposed to come back void, and they don't. But when we're responsive, when we're listening as if we're listening to God, there is a profound difference that takes place in our hearts. So one of the critiques recently I heard was, you know, that the the sermons are too long and that not you know people are not going to want to listen to that length of a sermon. And I can understand that. Like, you know, in this world today, we can go on YouTube, we can go on you know, um, get podcasts, and you know, we can listen to things for 15, 20 minutes, uh, sermons that are that length. Uh, but you know, my my goal is to not preach to you something that um, is flippantly done, first of all, and, uh, and I believe as there's more time that's, you know, that's used, there's more of an expression of that truth that hopefully will pierce your heart. Now, somewhat irrelevant, timing is somewhat irrelevant in this sense. Um, when, I, when I'm speaking, when anybody's speaking to you, uh, as we're listening, we're, we're called to be listening in the Spirit. So, as Christians, the Holy Spirit is in us. It's you know He is dwelling in us. We have the mind of Christ. We have the heart of God. We have the heart of Christ. You know, He's the the, the very God that raised Jesus from the dead is indwelling in us. And so, as we're listening to people speak, the Spirit in us is to confirm or to deny that which is being said. So, if we're listening to somebody and they're saying, like the other day, the other night I was in a Bible study, and um, you know, there were a lot of younger Christians in there, and they, we started talking about, you know, the excitement of Jesus' return, and what did that do? And we, when we read scriptures that talk about Jesus coming again, you know, how does that make us feel? And we got into to eternal damnation or eternal hell, and compared to eternal heaven, and, um, you know, one of the persons in this, in this study was like, well, you know, when you die, if you're not, if you don't know Jesus, you kind of just go into the la la land. And you're done. You don't, you don't have any more perception. And it's like, wait a second, where, where do you get that? Um, 
and then somebody else confirmed that. And I'm like, wait a second. Like, this is not true. This is not what Jesus preached at all. It is very clear in Scripture that Jesus saved us from something eternal, eternal separation from God. So, you know, it was just, it was vital that in that, in that moment I was listening to the Spirit, you know, as I was listening to them, and I'm sa saying, you know, this is not right. And actually some others in the, in the study, thankfully, stepped up, and, you know, there was Scripture that was quoted, and, and um, you know, these people kind of, I would say back down, that wasn't the point of it, was, but, but they really were, were taught wrong things in the past. It wasn't like they read the Bible and, and saw it and felt like, oh, you know, this is clearly says that there is, you know, just eternal heaven. And uh, those who don't have eternal glory in heaven with Jesus, you know, they just, nothing happens to them. Um, but it was obviously somebody who said something to them. In fact, one of the people there said that their pastor at their church, you know, kind of taught that. And I know, I don't, I don't know this pastor very well, but I, don't, I doubt highly that he's teaching that. But something that he said made him believe that was true. And so, I mean, not to expound on this too much, but we need to watch our hearts and understand that our hearts can mislead us as we desire certain things. Like all of us, I think, in our hearts, especially as, as Christians, but, you know, in terms of our love, but, but, you know, many people I've talked to that aren't believers, you know, don't want there to be a hell. Like, they just, they no, no one really wants to believe that there are people that are going to spend eternity in hell. And especially, that, I mean, maybe we'll say, well, Hitler, yeah, and, you know, child molesters, yeah, and, you know, there's a category of the wicked of the wicked that we could even comprehend, like, okay, they're going, you know, that would be, wouldn't be a bad thing if they were there because of the torture that they created in others. But these other people, like people that are just, you know, going through life and, you know, they deny Christ. You're like, really? They're going to be sent to eternal damnation, like the hellfires that are talked about in scriptures where they're separated from God for eternity? I mean, that's a little harsh. So I think all of us want to believe in ways that that doesn't exist. Now, as you get to know God more, you know that he's a just God, that he is a, he is a God that will, is going to eliminate all evil, all wickedness. And so he, being pure, has to eliminate that. That there's a wrath of God that is, um, that is waiting for the final judgment where all of that wickedness will be destroyed and it will be, you know, and those who don't have that relationship with Jesus will be cast away for eternal separation. And it's not God who casts them, it's them who disbelieve and who do not embrace, who in their pride say, you know what, that's not the way it is. It's not, you know, through Jesus that we know the Father. It's, it's just by our good works or it's, it's some, in some other way that we somehow make it into to heaven when the reality is Jesus has made it very clear God has made it very clear to us through Jesus coming and dying and, and rising from the grave that, the grave that that is the only way. That is the way that he has chosen, God has chosen for us. And so that come, brings us back again to this, this reality of our hearts. And, and where are, are our hearts? Are we receptive? Are we seeking the truth? Truly seeking the truth? Or, or are we seeking what we want to seek? Are we seeking what we want to be true? Because when we seek what we want to be true, oftentimes we will validate what we find to be true. So we will say, okay, this is, this is, this is the truth because I want that to be the truth. Whereas we're not objectively saying, okay, what I'm really seeking what the truth is. And whatever it is, I have to embrace it. Um, you know, there are many Christians. One, Lee Strobel is somebody that I encourage you to look up. He, he did, wrote a couple books, Case for Christ, Case for Faith, where he was an investigator who was like, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to objectively seek out this and see whether or not this is true and valid. And he wasn't a believer at the time. He was actually excited to find the truth out um, because he believed so strongly that the truth was going to um, you know, make him millions as he disproved Christianity. Uh, but the more he investigated, the more he, he researched, the more he interviewed, the more he actually opened his heart to that truth, the more God revealed the truth to him to a point where he couldn't deny that Jesus was who he said he was. And <clears throat> so, 
bringing this back to the original point of how how you listen to sermons, like what when you're listening to somebody speak, or not even sermons, but just when you're listening to a believer speak, be receptive to how the Spirit of God is moving in you. You don't need to listen to this whole sermon to get out something that God wants to very much encourage you in, or convict you in, or exhort you in, or you know, um, make you aware of. Even for somebody else, there are many times when I've listened to a sermon and God has prompted me to to reach out to somebody in my life and to love them more, to love them in a different way, or to share with them a truth that I realize that that they may be struggling with, that I perceive they may be struggling with that I can encourage them and help them and build them up. Um, so, you know, when I, when I preach a, an hour-long sermon, you know, don't feel guilty when you flip it off, you know. It, it, do what the Lord wants you to do. You know, if you, if you hear the first ten minutes and you're like, okay, that is exactly, you know, I, I needed to hear that part of it and God, you know, it's, it spoke to me through that, then great. You turn it off doesn't matter or if, if you fade out you know there's t many times when I'll listen to sermons and I'll be doing something <clears throat> and I'll hear some part of it and it'll hit me and I'll just go off in my mind on you know over that and then I'll come you know come back to the sermon and be like okay where is this person I, I totally lost track I just spent 15 minutes with the Lord there alone and he this guy's been speaking and it's just been blah 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 <laughs> Which is totally fine, because ultimately the reason why I'm preaching, the reason why we should all be speaking is so that people would be growing more intimate with God. That's the ultimate reason. That's the that's the primary reason. Um, it's definitely the primary reason why I'm, you know, preach to you. Why I speak to you is because I want you to grow more intimate with God. I don't need you to hear my whole sermon. I don't even need you to, you know, understand it all. I don't need it to be entertaining. Any of that kind of stuff. Like, it's irrelevant. That's why I ask for those who are critiquing me, were you touched by God's Spirit? Was there something that that the Spirit of God in you confirmed or, or encouraged you and or exhorted you in? So that's the goal. So as you're as you're listening, you know, the the questions you want to ask with the Spirit is are you true are you truly willing to embrace the truth regardless of what it is in your life. So when the Spirit of God convicts you, when He encourages you, are you willing to embrace what He's saying to you? Or are you hardened to some things? Because yeah, God, God desires a broken and contrite heart. He desires a heart that is desperate for His truth. Because there is the realization that comes upon every believer that is truly seeking God, that we are fault, we are we are um, we are weak, we are troubled. We bring our past into our present in a negative way. We are uh, imperfect. We think imperfectly. We have wants and desires that lead us astray all these things where we come to a point of desperation where we say, you know what, Lord, if I live my life apart from you, I will make so many poor choices that will lead others astray, that will cause pain in my in the life of my marriage, will cause pain in the life of my children, cause pain in the life of those around me. I will be a false witness to your truth, God. And so I'm just desperate to know you. I'm desperate to do what you want me to do. And so, Lord, I will do whatever you want me to do. <clears throat> that, that's where God just rejoices and says, yes, okay, you're ready. I'm re I want to use you in powerful, way, powerful ways. And so because of your heart, there's going to be a, a greater infilling of me in you so that you will produce the fruit that I desire for you to produce because you truly are being a servant of the Most High God. You truly are going to be obedient to what he wants you to do in your life. Um, so going into Hebrews now, Hebrews and, and please don't hesitate to ever you know ask questions or or comments or say I don't believe that or I don't think that's in scripture or uh, you know what do you mean by something you know I, I really thrive in that it is my passion to disciple and to encourage and to mentor and to to you know point you in the right direction in regards to getting those answers um, it's vital that we do that if something sparks in you and you don't know and you don't um, have the fullness of that concept in your life, you know, reach out. Reach out to brothers and sisters around you in the faith, but uh, definitely know that I'm, I'm available for that, for sure. 
Um, so first, uh, sorry, Hebrews 3, we, we did verse 1 basically last time we talked. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling. We got that point where, and this is kind of funny, because the next, next word is consider Jesus. The next word is consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. And that's as far as we're going to go. And last week I talked about this. And therefore, you know, considering all that we've talked about so, so far, Hebrews 1 and 2, Therefore, considering all that, holy brother, and all that was about Jesus, holy, holy brother, we talked about your holiness, that you're, you are holy in Christ, hallelujah. It is not that you are holy in yourself or by your actions. It is only by what Jesus has done for you. He covers you with his holiness. God sees Jesus when he sees you. Partakers of a heavenly calling, this, this mentality that we're in fellowship together, partaking together in this, this high calling of bringing people into the kingdom of God that has come to earth, but it will be forevermore. And then, and then uh, the author goes on to say, consider Jesus. So I, think it's, I thought it was pretty funny as I meditated on this where you know, the author is like, okay, considering all that was just been spoken, holy brothers, partakers in heavenly calling, consider Jesus again. Consider Jesus. <laughs> It is so, so true. Like in our lives, we, our, our call is to constantly be considering Jesus. And the, and the word considering is this. Considering is uh, to perceive or discern distinctly or clearly. To understand, consider, observe. To perceive, to observe. It is the mental correlative of sensational perception. This mentality of like what we perceive and like you know we, in our touch or or um, you know in our body even our emotions, but it's this this mental experience of something. In this case, of Jesus, the conscious action of the mind to understand, to apprehend, to learn, to know referring to the object of knowledge rather than the fact of knowing. So it's not just this, this mentality of, um, you know, okay, I, I, know, I know about Jesus. You know, I know that he was a, good, was a good man and that he did this and that and he acted this way or that way, but it's this actual um, ascent or, or a deeper understanding and knowledge of who Jesus is. And what's neat about this is that when, as, you, as you consider Jesus, as you perceive and understand him, you understand that he is in you, and that is how he desires for you to act, like in kind with him. But let's, let's dwell on that consideration first. In your life, what do you consider? What do you, how do you know things, as this is encouraging us to know Jesus? You know, we, uh, my brother is... Um, you know, an expert in the um, many things, but now I'm lost at the train of thought. He's an expert in home building for sure, but I, I didn't want to go there. It's uh, it's the in the in the market. Sorry. So the financial market. You know, he you can talk to him for hours about the market because of his consideration of it, and the workings, the inner workings of financial world. And he'll give you, as you're talking to him, you'll be like, well, what about this? You know, in my limited mental scope, I'll say, well, yeah, but then what about this? And he'll, you know, just go on for the next 15 minutes, getting deeper into the details of why that's the case and how that's the case and the history of, of what led up to this and, and then the potential futures of, of the repercussions of, you know, the potential futures or repercussions and or repercussions of what's going on and, you know, the... Uh, you know, he spent hours considering it because it's a passion of his, because he loves the market. The market can bring him financial, you know, blessing, but, but it, it, it's much more than that for him. That he really loves to think about that and how the market works. Um, you know, you could say that about wine. You could say that about whatever hobby that you have, but it's it's more than a hobby. That you've probably known people that have considered different things in their life and dwelled on them to understand them more fully. You know, the the um, for me, I've considered like the physical realm a lot in terms of like working out and muscle development and and health and nutrition and you know what makes a body tick and how. You know, when are we supposed to drink water? How are we supposed to drink water and protein? And how much, how much bread or if any should we have, um, etc. 
you know, what in your life do you consider like this that you know well? You know, do you consider your children? Do you consider the individual children that you have and really ponder them and, and think about them and what they need individually? Do you consider your wife or your husband? Do you take the time to consider them? Um, you know, the scripture obviously is pointing towards considering Jesus, but there, it, there are things that we consider that we need to consider more of in our lives. And for sure one of those is Jesus, and I want to get to that in a moment. But I feel like the Lord wants to encourage you to think about what those things are that you think about. What do you consider often in your life? Um, many people consider things that are not healthy and holy for them. So one, and one of those things may be something that you desperately want but you don't have. And so you just contemplate all the goodness that would come your way if you just had this or that. If only you had this, then you'd be happy. If only you had that, then you'd be happy. Um, or you, you might consider something in your life like a fear uh, that you just, you know, I'm not going to do that because then this will happen. And so you, you're, you're considering the, the consequences of behaviors not knowing what the consequences really b will be. You just are considering that fear and considering that, you know, thinking about that thing which um, may happen to you. And so you're overwhelmed by that, paralyzed by that, you know, and so disabled from doing something you may very well be called to, to do. Um, so w as I was preparing this sermon, I happened to be watching The Truman Show. And in The Truman Show, if you've not seen the movie, I recommend it. Uh, Jim Carrey is the main character in it. And in, in the movie, he is... Uh, basically put on film from birth and as he, he's birthed into this fake world where it's it's very real in the sense that there are people in the world and there's there are jobs but everybody's actors except for him he is in this bubble of a world where he is observed from all different angles and all different cam cameras and so the the world he watches him and have watched him since birth and as he's becoming an adult now, the, the, the kind of the movie picks up and all these people are watching him and are spending their time fixated on this man. Um, and his name of me now. But so, you know, I got, I got to thinking about this in the sense of like how we fixate ourselves on different things. Oftentimes we fixate on, on ourselves and what we need personally and what we want personally. And so we, we're considering our own needs. We're like, okay, so what about this? And yes, you may consider the needs of others sometimes, but you really, you know, a lot of what you're fixated on is yourself and how you need this or that. Um, and when you fixate on others, oftentimes, you're fixated in considering them for the purpose of how they can help you subtly. Um, but, you know, it was very interesting because I think it's true that many people fixate their minds on different things that are absolutely pointless to fixate on. They're definitely pointless in the sense of how much time we fixate on them. Because if we're considering eternity, if we're considering the eternal gift that God has given us, it puts in perspective what we're spending our minds and our time thinking about, considering, and the power that those things that we're considering have in our lives. What are they actually doing to benefit us? You know, I consider TV shows a lot, you know, in, the, in my Christian realm, my Christian life, and I look back and I think, oh man, I regret it. What a waste of time. I, I think about all the time I've spent in front of the TV, and, and recently, I mean, this has just been a conviction on my heart fairly recently, um, but, you know, I get in front of the TV and I enjoy movies, don't get me wrong, like, when God calls me to watch a movie, I believe that he speaks to me through movies, and it's good, and, and um, but the, the amount of time I've spent without that, where I've just, just watched the show for just the show's sake, without really having any eternal significance, has been paramount and foolishness and so you know in your heart today I encourage you to, to look at those things in your heart and mind what are those things that you're spending time considering and are they of any eternal benefit to you or to those around you is that which you are considering affecting you such that you're able to affect others in a more eternal way Okay, so for example, I have a buddy, he's like my brother, who loves the market. 
He's a solid Christian who just is a warrior for Christ. And he is going to use any benefit, any, any bonus that he gets from you know, the, the success he has in the market to bless the church, to give of his abundance to them, to others in need. And so number one, the eternal benefit of just even knowing the market is that God has given us a mind and he's given us passion, so there's nothing wrong with pursuing things like that, considering the market and, and all its intricacies. I think that's a glory to God. But the mind frame is that, and it comes to that, that when we're getting involved in something like that to that degree, that we're stopping and saying, am I, am I becoming too overwhelmed? Is this becoming an idol to me? Or am I really using it to glorify God? And there are times in my, you know, re like workout regimen when I've had to stop myself and say, what, is this really glorifying God? Like I'm spending an awful lot of time like at the gym or playing basketball. Like, you know, there, there, I definitely have been convicted of that with basketball where I'm like, okay, what am I doing? Like I'm out here playing and oftentimes I will even get frustrated and am I a witness to these people on the court? And so I really started to shift focus as I was going to play basketball. I was like, hey, this is good and, I'm, and I enjoy this and I'm considering this in the sense that I'm, I know this game and I love it, and I, but I want it to glorify God. So how, how am I enabling that to happen by being aware of those people that God is drawing me to on the basketball court? Same thing with the with the physical. You know, am I am I spreading that wealth of good of goodness, knowing you know how to stay healthy with those people around me? And I've found that as I as I've been aware of that I'm, I am able to encourage others. You know, just in being healthy. Like people, you know, I work with a guy um, recently who eats a lot of sugar, and he's like, you know, you want some of this? And I'm like, no. I'm like, this, you know, sugar really like gets me these days. Where like you know, if I'll, if I'll have a bag of M&M's, like, I'll, I won't feel good. Like, it just is, just the high fructose corn syrup, like, just affects my body to the point where I just don't want it. Um, because it, it's not good for, for me or for you. And, uh, you know, that I'm able to encourage others in that. Because ultimately, when we have, you know, our body is healthy, our mind is healthy. And when our mind is healthy, we're able to, you know, have, have that energy. Our, our minds are more aware and we're, we're able to think better and you get my point. Um, the, the encouragement again for you is to look at your life and see whether these things, God has put passions in your heart and desires and so it's good to consider those things. And in reality, when we're considering that which is good and of God, in a way we're very much considering Jesus because Jesus you know, was a carpenter and he, he knew his trade, you know, and he loved, he loved what he did. And he did, you know, he worked and did those things for the glory of God and for others around him. And we, we're called to do that in our lives. We're called to enjoy God's gifts to us. Um, but when it get, becomes an idol, it becomes very dangerous and, and takes away from the fruit that God wants to produce in you and through you. Um, so, we're supposed to consider Jesus. And as I was doing that, I just stopped and said, okay, Lord, you know, what does that look like? Um, and, and it's a very simple concept. It's stopping and thinking about Jesus, knowing him. You know, one of the ways you do that is clearly through scripture, that we, we actually look and see what he did. Okay, so, excuse me, the first, uh, the first thing that came to mind when I was considering Jesus was this, while we, were en while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. Have you considered the fact that you were at one point an enemy of God? And that Christ, as you consider, Christ died for you and me while we were his enemies. When we ponder that love, when we ponder Christ in general, we, we, we're drawn to him. We desire to behave like him. And in this, in this essence, um, and when we consider Christ's love for us, that despite us being his enemies, he still died for us, knowing the potential that we had in us, it, it can greatly encourage us. When we don't have Jesus as the focus of our affection, of our reason for living, we are pointing others to anything but what God has called us to help others to know. That is his love and call. And this is then, oh, this is 
as I was considering what Christ did for us, these thoughts started coming to my mind. The great thing about considering Jesus is it will spark renewal in us. It will spark deeper love in us. It will remind us of why we're here on this earth. It will remind us of why we're called to love our enemies. Why, who we are in Christ. You know, as, as He's shown mercy on us, that we'd show mercy on others. When we realize the depth of love that God has, has for us, we're able to love others more deeply. When we, when we realize more fully the sin that we lived in and we were enemies, then when we see others who are enemies of God, we're, we don't shun them or condemn them or judge them. Instead, we embrace them and nurture them and love them, knowing full well that Christ loved us and brought us from death into life. It made me think of the, the, the road that was narrow, though, also where God calls us into the into a narrow road that leads to glory and that the road is wide that leads to destruction now <laughs> as you consider Jesus he will bring you on a path and I, I don't even know how I got to this at this point at the, you know how how did I get to the point from Christ died you know Christ died for us when we were God's enemies to the road is wide that leads to destruction one thing I, I stop and do consistently as I'm considering Jesus is, is how does this point me into action? And for this, for me, you know, as I was considering Jesus' mercy on my life and his grace to me while I was still his enemy, it made me, it spurred me on to love others and to share the goodness of Christ with others around me. That I would be more adamant that Jesus was totally and completely content in the heavenly realm. There's nothing that we can give him. But in his love, he considered us and our predicament that we were destined for eternal separation from him when we die. And even when we were his enemies, he still came down and died for us. And how much we're called to do that. Do we, how, how are we considering the needs of others around us and loving them and blessing them the soul mind frame that we want to bring them into eternal relationship with God. I also consider what I'm doing in light of some of you out there. Like some of you may not know Jesus very well, and that's okay. God wants to develop our relationship with Him, and it is in His time. I think about the story. I just recently heard a sermon, and I thought this was really good. That we we often want to jump to a different place in our faith walk. We want to be like, oh, I just want to be there. I want to be more intimate with God and not yet. Or you want more of God and, and you're experiencing now. And um, As you consider Jesus' wisdom, though, and who he is and his discipleship of us, you can wait. You start to realize that God is good and it's good to seek him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. All that you are seeking him. But then in in that you can be content in where you're at. So as I was considering Jesus and his his love for me, and I, I this this is kind of the train of thought that he brought me in. Where he's like, you know, we <clears throat> as as immature believers, we will oftentimes put ourselves down and say, you know what, I'm not where I'm supposed to be. And that's a lie. You're exactly where you're supposed to be. You don't need to be anywhere that you're not supposed to be. You just need to sit and rest and be with the Lord and allow Him to take over your heart and stop belittling the maturity that you do have in Him. You know, the disciples walked with Jesus for three years. When He died and rose from the dead, He went out to the fishermen, you know, to Peter and said, you know, throw down your nets. He called them little children. Despite their walk with Him for years, He still was calling them little children. It's okay to walk in in uh, humility in that understanding that God is so much greater than who we are it is a place of, of reliance and trust it's a place of saying okay you know, I may be even mature in the faith I may have walked with the Lord for a decade or more and, but to still understand that you, there's so much that you can learn that you still need to be obedient like a child still need to be as, as, 
unquestioning as a child whose father says, hey, don't go out into that road because you're going to get killed if you do. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to wrap this up because uh, I believe God wants me to. Um, now I cry out daily for more of who the Lord is, and my encouragement to you is to do that, to, to cry out for more of an epiphany of who Jesus is, for he is the one who will give you the revelation. But it is clear in the scripture as you read through the Bible who Jesus is. And so consider him. And take the time to consider Christ and what he's done and who he is. Ponder who he is as an apostle and as a high priest. Apostle means messenger. That he came from the Father as a messenger to us to reveal the way into eternal salvation. He is the high priest who on our behalf goes to the Father and says, the sacrifice has been made. <clears throat> they believe upon it. Set them free. And so, as you go forth in your ministry, as you go forth in your life, um, take the time this week, daily, I would encourage you daily, to stop and say, Jesus, and consider who he is. Just Consider one facet of him that you know about him. It may be his gentleness. It may be his strength. It may be his wisdom. It may be his power. <clears throat> Excuse me. Maybe his healing power. Maybe his transforming power. Maybe his purity. And as you consider him, realize that he is in you. And he desires to be a representation. He desires you to be representation of him as you walk forth. And so as you consider a trait of his, you know, ask God to fill you in that manner that you would walk as Jesus did. So in the name of Jesus, I pray for those who are in the sound of my voice, <clears throat> that they would know you, that they would be encouraged in their walk with you, that they would hear your voice, still them, give them peace, that they would understand your great love for them. Help them to see you and who you are. That they would consider you Jesus. They would know you, experience you in their minds and in their hearts. Know you as their friend, their best friend. Know you as their guide, as their savior. And then as they consider you, put into practice knowing that they have your mind Jesus they have your heart and that you will empower them to walk in your fruit in Jesus name Amen